I want you to uh, think for a second about what your favorite Christmas carol is. Now, that might, that might be hard to come up with. Uh, if you're like me, it depends on the year um, and maybe on the mood, right, um, or the context. Different years, different Christmas carols just sort of capture my heart in different ways. One of the things I love about the Christmas carols is the theology. They're so rich. There's so much that you can glean and gain as you're meditating on these truths that we sing every year. And I think something else that's special about them is we sort of reserve them for just this time of year. Everybody knows it's illegal to listen to Christmas carols outside of November, December, maybe a little bit into January, right? We, so uh, we have 12 days of Christmas. So we can go through January 6th, but then after that, right, no more. We need to save them, keep them special. You know, um, Les and I have to strategize every single year. We created like a, a table to make sure that we get all of the favorites, right? Because we know that there will be a riot if we don't sing your favorite. Now, now as I, I did some research to try to figure out what the most popular Christmas carols were. One of the ways I can do that is look at CCLI. And every single time we sing a song here, we have to register that with CCLI. So the most registered song this year for Christmas um, was Joy to the World by Chris Tomlin. Chris Tomlin's version of Joy to the World. Number two was Joy to the World by Phil Wickham. Um, and so I, I think that we can agree Joy to the World is a, a pretty popular Christmas carol. Actually, in history, it's number two based on copyright. So based on uh, if somebody is going to record it, they have to um, file a copyright. And uh, Joy to the World's number two. Number one is Silent Night. But what's interesting about Joy to the World being one of the most popular Christmas carols is that it's not. Have you noticed that? When you sing Joy to the World, where does it talk about Jesus' birth? Where does it talk about the Christ child? There's no content in there at all about Bethlehem or the shepherds or the angels or Mary or Joseph. What's it about? Well, Joy to the World is actually based on Psalm 98. It was written by Isaac Watts, and I want to share with you a little bit of the, the details about this Christmas carol and how it sort of became accidentally a famous Christmas carol. So Isaac Watts wrote this in 1719. It was part of uh, a whole list of songs that he wrote for his church. Now Isaac Watts is a very interesting person. If you want to spend some time studying somebody who's sort of captivating, study him. He was a savant. He was a genius. At four years old, he learned Latin. At nine, he learned Greek. Um, at 13, he learned Hebrew. Okay, so this guy's, this guy's a genius. Um, he, he was a pastor, and he wrote 750 hymns. He wrote, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. You're probably familiar with that one. Um, but something interesting about him is he grew up at a time when the Anglican church was in power, and his father was a nonconformist. And Isaac Watts was actually born while his father was in prison. Legend has it that he is nursed on the prison steps. But a, as he grew up in an, a nonconformist church, um, he shared with his father that he didn't like singing the psalms set to meter. And it wasn't because of the words, it was because of the attitude. He, he said the, the congregants seem so somber as they're singing. They should be joyful. They should be exalting. They should be celebrating. And so his dad looked at him and he said, okay, you write something better. And so he did. In 1719, he, he published his first set of psalms set to meter, but he did something different from anybody else of his day. He, he really is the one who sort of invented the writing of hymns, because before that, they just did the psalms, and they would take them word for word and just set them to meter and sing through them. And, and he said, I want to make them rhyme, and, and I want to look at it, and I want to come up with a paraphrase that's looking through the lens of the New Testament. So he'd look at the psalms through the lens of the New Testament. So instead of, um, you know, singing about God giving the Israelites victory over their enemies, he'd sing about God giving the Christian victory over sin. And so he'd be looking at it through the, the lens of the New Testament. He was seen as a heretic. Joy to the world was heretical because it wasn't word for word from Psalm 98. Instead, it was a paraphrase. They, 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 called, it, they called them Watts whims. That's what they called these. They, they were not allowed to sing these in the Anglican church, but they were widely popular after his death, and most of our uh, most popular hymns today were written by him. So he wrote this based on Psalm 98, and what he saw in Psalm 98 wasn't an anticipation of the Messiah's first coming, but of his second coming. See, Joy to the World is a song that's about Christ's return, and, and it really is appropriate for us to sing that at Christmas, because the reality is Jesus has come, but he's coming again. Uh, do you remember what happened 
when, when Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared to his disciples one last time and then he ascended into heaven. Do you remember what the angel said? He, he said, just like you saw him ascending, he's going to return. And, and that's meant to bring the greatest joy to us. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter, it describes that as a joy that's unspeakable. We cannot express it, and he describes it as full of glory. And so what I want to do today is I just want to explore why is it that Jesus' second coming, his second advent, should bring us such great joy. And to answer that question, we'll look at 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 9. So beginning in verse 3, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Now, I would love to spend time expositing this text, but this text is just introductory. We're going to get into the passage. Um, but here's what I hope. I hope that you're disappointed I'm not expositing this text today. I, I hope that you're, you're thinking, there's so much good stuff there. You should talk about that. Meditate on that. R you can read this if you guys have a copy, okay? Just take it home with you. Read it. Spend some time in this. But just a couple of comments. First of all, understand what we've been born again to God's, God caused us to be born again. It's his work that's caused us to be born again. Born again to what? To a living hope. What does that mean? What's a living hope? Why does he describe it that way? We talked about hope last Christmas season. Do you remember that? And I gave you a definition. What's hope? It's completely different from what the world means when they say hope. What are they talking about when they say hope? They're talking about wishing on a star. They're talking about something that's wishy-washy. Maybe so, it would seem like it could happen in my wildest dreams, but it's not something that is certain. When we talk about hope in Scripture, we're talking about an eager expectation of a certain event. I know it's going to happen. I have faith in a future event. I am confident this will come to pass. So when we talk about a living hope, we're talking about an eager expectation of a certain future. This is coming. This is going to happen. There's not a doubt in my mind. Uh, but we've not only been born again to a living hope, he says, and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. What's the inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading? What, what is he talking about? What is it that I inherit when I get to heaven? You remember what Jesus said? He said, if I go, I go to prepare a place for you. That, where I am, there you may be also. There you may also be. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present, Present with the Lord. What's the inheritance? Jesus. His presence. We're going we're gonna to ascend into heaven, and then what's going to happen? And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's your inheritance. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It doesn't fade away. Why? Because it's Jesus. He's eternal. He's not going to perish. He's not going to be defiled. He's not going to fade away. He's waiting for you. He's preparing a place for you. And your longing, your hope, is to one day be with him forever. This is the eager expectation. This is the joyful exultation of the heart of every single believer as we anticipate the wonders of heaven in the presence of Jesus forevermore. The passage goes on, verse 5, he says this, You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready, ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. So that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seen him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Look at verse 8. Look at the end of verse 8. Well, I want you to notice the description of joy that believers experience, that you get to experience as a new creation, as someone who's been born again to a living hope. You get to rejoice with inexpressible and glorious 
joy. This is what you have inside of you. This is out of the world, divine, supernatural, inexpressible, glorious joy. Why? Because I'm receiving the goal of my faith, the salvation of my soul. When? When he appears. When he appears and I see him as he is and I'm like him because I see him as he is. That's what my soul longs for. And in longing for that, I am rejoicing with joy inexpressible and full of glory. What I see in this passage is that we rejoice with inexpressible joy because Jesus will return. That's where you guys just say amen. Let me say it again. Let's start again. <laughs> we rejoice with inexpressible joy because Jesus will return. Amen. There you go. Okay, you guys are getting there. I know it's the day after Christmas, right? And the cookies are just wearing off. So th this is who you are. This is who you are in Christ. You are a new creation filled up with inexpressible joy. Why? Because the one you love the most is going to appear. The one you love more than any other is going to appear upon this earth. This passage, what I see, what I'm going to look at today is two reasons that his return is going to bring us joy. Two reasons I see in 1 Peter 1 that Jesus' return brings us joy. First is, in his return, my salvation is completed. In his return, my salvation is completed. What, what does that mean? What's it mean when he returns, then... In that future moment, my salvation is complete. Look at verse 5 right here. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be re revealed in the last time. Now, 1 Peter 1, 5 can be a little bit confusing because I, I thought I was already saved, right? Like, didn't that happen when I confessed Jesus as Lord, right? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Isn't that a past experience for every single believer? Why is it describing it as future? So the question I want to ask is, salvation something that we experience in the past, in the present, or in the future? And hopefully you know the answer to most of my questions is yes. Because <laughs> what's it say? Ephesians 2.8. Ephesians 2 8, for by grace, or for you are saved by grace through faith, and it's not from yourselves, it is God's gift. This is in the past. God gave you the gift of salvation. You confessed him as Lord. Light dawned in your heart. You saw the glory of Jesus and you gave your life to him. That treasure hidden in the field was worth losing everything for, and you presented yourself to him as a living sacrifice. That's in the past. You were born again. In one glorious moment, you were transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. This happened in your past. But in 1 Corinthians 1.18, it describes it as a present experience. It says this, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but is the power of God to us who are being saved. Present, continuous. This is a process. I'm in process. I'm being saved. I'm experiencing this right now. Paul says it this way, work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who's working in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. I am working as God is working presently today. This is a present experience of my salvation. So it's past, it's present, and then we saw already 1 Peter 1, 5, it's future, a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now what does that mean? Salvation in the past. My salvation is finished at the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was. That salvation I received is secure. And this is why it's so important that you notice that word guarded. Do you see that word guarded at the start of the verse? You are being guarded. What are you being guarded by? What is it that we're being guarded by? You're being guarded by God's power. You see that? I want you to understand this. You're not being guarded by a power that's destructible. You're not being guarded by a power that can be overturned. You're not being guarded by a power that anything in this world can stand against. If God is for us, who can stand against us? Nothing is going to be able to separate us from what? The love of God. So while salvation is past, present, and future, that does not mean you won't receive it in the future. Don't think that it's this nebulous thing that hopefully you get there and it's completed. 
like a, ba- a cake that you're baking in the oven. And, and hopefully, you know, hopefully it gets baked all the way. You don't want to get it out and have it, you know, be a little soggy in the middle. Nobody wants that. That's not how God rolls. That's not what he does. What he's doing, he's going to do it perfectly. And he's going to guard you by his power. And so while we're looking forward to the day when my salvation is completed and God says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, there is no doubt in my mind that I will stand before him on that final day and he will welcome me into his eternal presence. Why? Because of his power. And and if you're wondering, well, you know, what if what if I could somehow lose that? Well, then you have to be more powerful than him. To get yourself out of his hand, you need to be more powerful than God himself. And so the reality of a salvation that is past, present, and future does not take away our confidence. Rather, it builds our confidence. Because the salvation that I am working is God working. And what am I doing? Resting in him, relying on him, depending on him to do what he has promised to do. In between the salvation that I've received and that hope of eternal glory, God is guarding me. I want you to understand this because in ancient Israel, they got this concept. We are betrothed, but not yet wed. We are betrothed, but not yet wed. And and the problem is in our culture today, an engagement does not set the same precedent that betrothal did in Jesus' day, in Peter's day when he wrote these words. You see, when you're betrothed, for that betrothal to break, it's just like breaking the marriage covenant. The covenant has already been made. The promise has been made. The promise has been made. Jesus Christ has been made a promise. He sealed it in his blood. This covenant, this promise is you are my bride. I'm going to build my church. I'm going to receive you to myself. I promise it's going to be done. It cannot be broken, but we're not yet wed. And I want you to understand this, that the longing of the bride is to see the groom on the wedding day. And there's no lack of confidence in us that our groom will be waiting for us. We'll be awaiting our arrival because he has made a promise. This is the goal of our faith. Listen to what's described in verse 9. Because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is my living hope. This is my expectation. I will receive the goal of my faith. The goal of my faith is the salvation of my soul. What God has begun, he will finish. Have you ever noticed the type of confidence that Paul speaks with when he writes letters to people who are failing? Very confident concerning you, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. How can he have such confidence in people? He doesn't have confidence in people. He has confidence in their God. He has confidence in their bridegroom, that he will see it done, that he will bring it to completion. That day, that final day, my inheritance will be revealed. And what is my inheritance? What is the goal of my faith? To be with Jesus forever. This is what I long for. This is what I was designed for. This is what I was made for. what's What's the inheritance of the bride on her wedding day? The groom. Do you understand that? That's what she gets. That's what she's looking forward to. That's what we, the church, are looking forward to. We're looking forward to that marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to sit with our groom on that glorious day, and we are going to be joined to him forever. But last week I talked about our union with Christ, and we're experiencing it now, but then fully. We're seen dimly now, but then face to face. And what happens when we see him face to face? When we behold him as he is, we're going to be like him on that final day. This is what you long for. This is what you're looking forward to. The start of this series, I talked to you about the joy of anticipation. And I talked about how we're between two comings of Jesus. He has come and he's going to come again. And between those two comings, we are being guarded by his power. And we're not just being guarded, we're also being refined. Look at the passage. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. He says this, You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable, is refined by fire, 
may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now look at, look at verse 6. Look at the word this. He says you rejoice in this. What's this talking about? This is actually pointing back to the word hope in verse 3. The living hope that I've been born again to. I'm rejoicing in what? I'm rejoicing in hope. And what's happening while I'm rejoicing in hope? Pain, suffering, hardship, sorrows, trials. And in the midst of that pain, suffering, hardship, and trials, I'm rejoicing in hope. Why? Because as I go through the pain, the suffering, the hardships, and trials, I have an inheritance that's not corrupted by that pain that's not defiled by the tragedies that I experience here on earth. It's not shaken by the sorrow that I endure in this life. It hasn't been changed. The hope that I have is still the same. And so today, in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering, I can rejoice. And why am I able to rejoice? It's not just because my hope is unshakable. It's because I know that the trial has a purpose. I'm rejoicing because of hope, and I'm rejoicing because of the grief I'm suffering is under the sovereignty and perfect providence of God. And why is he allowing me to suffer? Because he's refining me. He's using that fire in my life to refine me. He says the proven character of your faith is more valuable than gold, which is though perishable, as refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What, what, what am I rejoicing in? It's my hope, but it's also this reality. My faith is able to be proven in this moment. God has brought this trial into my life so that I can know he holds me fast, so that the world can know he holds me fast, so the world can see the excellencies of the power is not the earthen vessel but the treasure that's within it. And how does God manifest the treasure that he's placed within every single one of us? Through fire. Why? Because that's how gold is refined. Now it's interesting, he says gold is perishable. What is he talking about? Gold is perishable? Gold isn't perishable. You can melt that and it's still there. You still got gold. What is he talking about when he says gold is perishable? Well, one day the elements, including gold, are going to melt with fervent heat. That gold's not going to endure. You know what is going to endure? Your faith. Your faith is going to endure the end of all things, the melting of everything with fervent heat. Your faith is going to endure that, and in this moment, it's being refined through fire. Now, just think about the illustration that Peter's using. He's describing this refining process. How does that work? How is gold refined? It's heated up. It's almost 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And why why do they heat it up to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit? Because it has all these impurities in it. They mine the ore. As they bring out that ore, that's not pure gold. It has all sorts of other minerals, all sorts of defects, everything that needs to be removed. And to remove it, what do they do? Well, nowadays they do it a little differently. They use chemicals. But back then, what do they do? They heated it up to 2,000 degrees. And what happens to gold? And all of the other minerals and elements that are mixed in with it, when it's heated up to 2,000 degrees, gold is dense. So it goes and sinks down. And everything else comes to the top. And what do they do with all of that? That that dross, they scrape it off of the top. They remove it. You can't do that without melting it, without heating it up, without superheating that gold. You cannot remove it the impurities. You see, it's in my trial, in my suffering, that I see those places where I'm holding fast to the world and not to God. Where I'm depending upon my flesh and not on my Father. Where I'm walking in my strength and not in His. Those impurities are brought to the surface so that I can do what? So I can let go of my own strength, my own abilities, my own desires, and hold fast to His. And what's left is that gold, that treasure, that goal of my faith. All I need, Jesus, is you. And so you bring me into the trial so I'll remember that. So I'll realize I was designed to live in perfect communion with you. That's who I am. And it's your trial, it's your testing that brings that to the surface in my life. See, every single trial is an opportunity for you to see that your hope is alive 
and your faith is genuine. The trial brings that to the surface. This is why Peter describes it this way. In 1 Peter chapter 4, a couple chapters later, he says, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among, among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. When you go through the fiery trial, don't think, why is this happening? This has never happened to a Christian before. This has never happened to a believer before. Look down through all of the history of the church, and what do you see? Trial, tribulation, persecution, sorrow, pain. Why? Because that's how he refines us. That's how he forms us. That's how he reminds us of what will last and what is fading away. That's how he brings into our vision what is perishing and what will endure. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. This is the goal of my faith, his glory. You see what it said in verse 7 there? After the trial, after the refining of your, your faith, you may be found to praise, honor, and glorify Jesus. That's what I want. I want Jesus to be glorified. Now what's interesting about verse 7 there is it's talking about the praise, the honor, and the glory of the saint, of your faith in that final day. What does your heavenly Father say? Well done. Do you understand that? God's going to praise you. Do you get that? Well done, good and faithful. How are you going to feel on that day? No! Don't praise me. Every single thing that I did that was good wasn't me. It was you in me. It was Christ in me, the hope of glory. That's why I live the way I live. That's how I did the things I did. Honor? You're going to honor me? How can you honor me? I'm not honorable. Everything that I've done that's honorable wasn't me doing it. It was you doing it through me. Glory? We're going to share in his glory. That's the goal of your salvation. This is where we're going. Glorification. And understand, nothing can take that away. Because the Lord has chosen you, whom he saves. What does he do? Whom he calls, he justifies. And if he justifies you, what is he going to ultimately do? He's going to glorify you. This is the end of the story. This is where you're going. But understand, when you get to that final day and his glory is shining on you and you're reflecting his glory, you're going to get this. This isn't me. This isn't about me. It's all for him. But that's what I was made for. I was made to bring honor to him. And that's the moment where your salvation is complete. Salvation is complete on that final day when he is glorified. That's the end of salvation. That's what we long for. We rejoice while we look forward to that with inexpressible joy because Jesus will return. My salvation will be completed. Two reasons. First is, in his return, my salvation is completed. The second thing I want to show you here is in his return, my greatest love is revealed. In his return, my greatest love is revealed. What does that mean? Look at verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seen him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I want you to understand this. To know Jesus is to love Jesus and to long for his return. Now, now listen to Peter's words and, and make sure you're reading Scripture correctly. You don't read it through the filter of your experience. You read it through the filter of faith. And what does that mean? This means this is describing who you are in Christ. And so listen to his words. Though you have not seen him, you love him. I want you to hear that, not as condemnation, but as commendation. What do I mean? I mean, Peter is reminding you, you love him. You haven't seen him. You love him. This is who you are. You are in love with with Jesus. And why? Why are you in love with Jesus? Because you, you made yourself fall in love with him, right? You figured it all out. You did the math. You calculated how much, how great and good he is, and then you loved him, right? Is that what happened? No. Why do you love him? Because he first loved you. Why do you love him? Because he forgave you so much. Your love for him begins with comprehending his love for you. That's why Paul prays for the Ephesians, that they may comprehend his incomprehensible love because it's beyond our ability to comprehend so he says i pray that you can comprehend this that you can understand what can't be understood that that miracle can come awake in your own life you love jesus 
If you're sitting here today and you're thinking, yeah, you know, man, what you're describing, this love, this passion, I, not, I, don't, I don't feel it. Don't interpret your faith based on your feelings. Interpret it based on the word of God. Do you know that he loves you? Do you know that he sent his son to die for your sins? Abide in that love, and I can guarantee you this, you're going to fall more in love with Jesus. But the more you try, the more you say, okay, I'm going to make myself love him. I'm going to try really, really hard to love him. That's not abiding in his love. Abiding in his love means dwelling continually in the place where you are confident. He loves me unconditionally. Not because of what I've done. Not because of who I am. Not because of what I bring. But because he is love. He loves me. And as you comprehend that, you know what? You love him. You haven't seen him. You love him. How do I know? Because that's how it works. Because that's what God's word says. And what Peter's doing is he's calling this to life inside of you. Hear his word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And understand this as well. Faith works through love. Because you know he loves you, you know you can depend on him. You know you can rely on him. You know he's going to give you everything you need to live in dependence upon him so you can accomplish everything he sends you to accomplish. To know Jesus is to love Jesus even though you haven't seen Jesus. Jesus. Listen to how the psalmist describes it in Psalm 73. He says, who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The, the joy that I'm talking about right here today, it, it blooms in the heart of the believer who recognizes this truth. The one desire I have, the singular desire I have is for him and until you begin to comprehend that that's your desire that's your hope that's what you're longing for this joy is not going to come this joy comes from recognizing that singular desire who do i have in heaven but you and i desire nothing on earth but you and i want you to understand this this glorious truth and he is your portion forever do you hear that? He is your portion forever. Jesus has provided himself to you. His body, his flesh, your food, the bread of life provided to you as your portion forever. He's never going to take that away from you. He has provided it to you and he will be yours forever, for all of eternity. Do you understand this good news today? The one you want, the one you desire, is the one you have. That desire that burns in the heart of all of creation has been seen for what it truly is by every new creation. You comprehend. I was created to desire God, to long for Jesus, to dwell in his presence. And I will not be satisfied with anything else. And he is my portion forever. Spurgeon understood this. Listen to his description. He says this, when the child of God after admiring the character and wondering at the acts of God, can all the while feel, he is my God, I have taken him to be mine, he has taken me to be his, he has grasped me with the hand of his powerful love, having loved me with an everlasting love, with the bands of loving kindness, he has drawn me to himself, my beloved is mine and I am his. Why then, his soul would fain dance like David before the ark of the Lord, rejoicing in the Lord with all his might. But why does Spurgeon say that our soul should dance? Because we're loved by God and we love God. Because I am my beloved's and he is mine. There could be no greater news than I'm loved by love himself. And it's in being loved that I love him. It's in being forgiven much that I come to love much. Are you sitting here and thinking, man, that sounds like a really passionate love. I don't know if I'm there. Then you need to meditate on this truth. He forgives you unconditionally. It's in understanding that. It's in comprehending the incomprehensible, unconditional mercy, love of God 
that you're going to come to that place where you break down and you realize, I've been living for something other than you. I've been longing for a life. What I need is you. And what he provides to you is himself. It's so important that you comprehend that the eternal life that every believer receives is relationship with the Godhead. Eternal life is what? It's to know him. John 17, 3, Jesus says this. He says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and the one you have sent. Here's one of the problems I think. I think that a lot of people come to Jesus and they think this. They think eternal life is heaven with Jesus thrown in. No, that's not eternal life. Eternal life is Jesus with heaven thrown in. You see, see, heaven's the, the, the extra. Heaven is the frosting. Jesus is the cake. Jesus is everything that you desire. That's why heaven is heaven. That's why you long for heaven. That's why you long for eternity. That's why you're looking forward to his appearing. Why? Because so shall you ever be with the Lord. That's what you want. That's what you're hungering and thirsting for. Heaven is Christ. His presence is what makes it heaven. This is what you long for. We rejoice in his return. Why? Because we love his appearing. Do you love his appearing? Listen, listen to Paul's description in his second epistle at the end of his life. He's just now said there's, there's a reward. He's ready to be poured out like a drink offering. And then he says this, there is a reserve for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. I want you to think about this for a second, because this is mind blowing. Paul says, here's what sets me apart. I love his appearing. Are you like me? then you know what's going to happen? He's going to crown you on the final day. God's going to crown you. And that should just blow your mind that he's going to crown you because he saved you. He picked you up out of the gutter. He washed you. He welcomed you into relationship with him right now. And that blows your mind. But one day he's going to welcome you into his presence forever. And he's going to crown you with his righteousness. And you're going to share his glory. This is what awaits you. And it's what you long for. And it's what you love. You love his appearing. This is who you are as a new creation. Do you you understand that in heaven, what's going to bring me pleasure forevermore is his presence. That the reason that heaven is so joyful that I'm loving his appearing is because that's what I want. I want to see him. I want to hear him. I want to be with him. I want to fellowship with Jesus. That's what I want. And understand this, when you experience that, you will not want for anything else. You're not going to sit there in heaven and say, okay, I saw Jesus. What else does this place have? (laughs) This is pretty cool, Jesus. You got any presents for me? Is there anything else you can give me? I was trying to think of an illustration for this. And the illustration I came up with is maybe a little bit crude, but I I love Tolkien. And so I'm going to use his illustration. This is Gimli. (laughs) Gimli and the Fellowship of the Rings. Um, he meets this, this elf queen, Lady Galadriel. And if you're familiar with the Fellowship of the Ring, you know his response to Lady Galadriel before he thinks that she's some sort of witch who's going to curse him, right? But once he meets her, he is just awestruck by her presence. And at the end of his time there in her kingdom, he's leaving, and she's giving gifts to everybody in his fellowship, in his group. And she gets to him, and she asks him, what, what gift do you want, Gimli? And he said, I can't ask for a gift because I've heard you, and I've seen you, and I want for nothing more. Her presence, seeing her, beholding her, hearing her voice, that's all that he wanted. You understand, that's what it's going to be like in heaven. You're not going to be looking around. You're going to have eyes for one. You're going to enter into relationship with love himself, with the one who loves you perfectly, The greatest pleasure of heaven is going to be the pleasure of beholding the face of your Lord and hearing his voice. I've learned probably more about heaven from Randy Alcorn than anybody else in my life. It's interesting how sometimes God sort of gifts people with a passion for a concept in Scripture. And Randy Alcorn is one of those people who really explains heaven well. He has a ministry called Eternal Perspective Ministries. He's written a book called Heaven. 
And this, this is what he says in, in a blog that he wrote about heaven. He says this, Because he is beautiful beyond measure, if we knew nothing more than that heaven was God's dwelling place, it'd be more than enough to make us long to be there. That's all I need. It's interesting, right, to think about what's it going to be like in heaven? What f- sort of things are we going to do? What sports are there going to be besides running, right? These are the questions that we have about heaven, but we don't need to wonder about that. We don't need to wonder, is it going to be exciting? Are they going to have my favorite foods? I don't need to worry about that because what's going to be there? God's going to be there. Jesus is going to be there. I'm going to be in his presence. And everything that I experience on earth is going to be perfectly experienced in his presence because that's how I was designed to live. I was designed to fellowship with him. I was designed to walk in the garden with him, not by myself. And one day I'm going to be with him forever. John Milton says it this way, Thy presence makes our paradise, and where thou art is heaven. It doesn't mean that we're not going to enjoy anything else in heaven. It simply means that we're going to enjoy it rightly. I told you last week that union with Christ allows us to experience the pleasures of this earth as they were designed to be experienced, and in heaven we're going to experience that perfectly. Right now, the the blessing of good food and taste buds and children and the blessing of family and gathering, it's a good and perfect gift coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, and it directs my eyes to him in wonder and awe, and in heaven it continues. There's not a shadow of turning. God continues to be good in heaven. I continue to taste and see the Lord is good in heaven, but now I'm tasting it with all my taste buds. Now I'm tasting it perfectly. Now I'm experiencing it like never before. But listen to David's description in Psalm 38. He says, They are filled with the abundance of your house. You let them drink from your refreshing stream, for the wellspring of life is with you. By means of your light, we see light. Do you see how David describes our eternal home. He describes it in terms of our experience of God there. Listen to what he says. We're filled with the abundance of your house. You let them drink from your refreshing stream. This is a stream that's issuing forth from his throne. It's from his presence. You see, all the joys of heaven are the joys of the goodness of God. And they remind me continually of his presence there with me. The, the first meal that we have in heaven is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and you've never had a meal like that, not because the food is exquisite, but because the company is. Because your groom is sitting there. I have no idea what the food tasted like on my wedding day. Don't care. It was not what it was about. Right? Don't waste a lot of money on catering on your wedding day, because you're going to forget about it. Because you're going to be so in awe that your spouse is now your spouse, your one flesh with them. That's what you're passionate about. This is what we will long for. This is what we will experience. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. Why? John 14, 3. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. This is our longing. Our longing is to be with him. Why is he preparing a place? So we can be with him. Don't get distracted with the place. What's it like? Jesus, you put on a new wing because I serve those homeless people over there? How about that? No, I'm going to be with you. That's what, that's what he's making. He's making a place where I can be with him. Everyone is going to be able to be with him. Everyone who has given their life to Jesus is going to be able to enjoy perfect fellowship with him forever. Jesus is what makes the new heavens and the new earth our forever home. It's his presence. If he's not there, It's not home. If he's not there, I don't want to go. Listen to this description, Revelation 21. You're going to, if you're reading through the New Testament in a year, you're going to read this this week. This is the end. This is what we're rejoicing in. This is what we're rejoicing with joy and expressible longing for. It's this. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. What makes the new heavens and the new earth joyous is the presence of God, and we'll be with him forever. This is what you were made for. You were created for fellowship with the Almighty. One of the problems I think that we have sometimes is we think about heaven and all of its frills. We think about heaven, and, and we try to sell 
heaven as a means to proclaiming the gospel. And here's the problem. The gospel isn't a means to get people into heaven. It's a means to get people to God. Do you understand that? That's why we share the gospel. That's why we share the good news. Is He's bridged a way for us to go over that gap, that separation between God and and man, so we can enter back into fellowship with him. That's what we're inviting people to. We're not inviting them into heaven. We're inviting them in the presence of God. That's what you long for. I love the way Piper describes this. He says this, Christ did not die to forgive sinners who go on treasuring anything above seeing and savoring God. And people who would be happy in heaven if Christ were not there will not be there. The gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It is a way to get people to to God. Do you understand that? Make sure you're not preaching a false gospel. It's not a get out of hell. It's not a get into pleasure. It's a get into his presence forever. Why did, why did Christ suffer in the flesh? 1 Peter 3.18. Why did he suffer in the flesh? In order to bring us to God. The, the reason that heaven's pleasurable is because that's at the right hand of God. And that's where pleasures forevermore are. If you're struggling to comprehend this, understand you're in good company. David, at times, struggled to comprehend this. And so you know what he did? He preached to himself. He says this in Psalm 43. Then I will come to the altar of God. To God, my greatest joy, I will praise you with a lyre. God, my God. If I just read that verse, you'd think, okay, yeah, he's got it. He's got it figured out. God's his greatest joy. He doesn't need anything else. If he has his greatest joy, what else does he need? And then he asks this question, why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Do, do you know what David's doing to himself right here? He's preaching to himself. Do you know you need to preach to yourself? I told my seven-year-old that this week. She didn't get it. She's like, I'm not a pastor. I can't do that. You preach to yourself. That's what David's doing. He's saying, soul, what's your problem? Come on, soul. Look at God. Hope in God. He's your greatest joy. Yeah, people aren't being nice to you. Yes, people are taking away things that belong to you. Yes, people are abusing you. Yes, people are evil and wicked, and you're going to suffer in this life. But that's not your greatest joy. The things on this earth, they're going to perish with the using. But that's not your greatest joy. Oh, my soul, hope in God. Hope in God. He's my greatest joy. Imagine, imagine what, what heaven would be like without Jesus. Can you imagine that? There's no heaven. It's like going on the honeymoon with no groom, right? It's not a happy honeymoon. That's not what it's about. You don't want to go on the honeymoon. You don't want to have the wedding and go to the reception and oh, the groom's not there. But let's celebrate anyways. No, it's meant to celebrate the union. And in eternity, that union is forever. This is what you long for. You long for fellowship with God. This is who you are. And, and I, I want to I ask this question. This is a rhetorical question, but I want you just to think about this for a second. Do you long for his return? Is that the longing of your heart? Now, if you're sitting here today and, and you're thinking, no, I don't long for his return. That's not what I'm looking forward to. There's one of two things that are happening. Either one, you're dead in your trespasses and sins, and I have good news for you today. If you repent, if you confess, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And when you believe that you are forgiven, you will love much. And the one who loves Jesus longs for his return. Or maybe you have been forgiven much. Maybe you have confessed your sins, but you've lost your way. Maybe you've forgotten what heaven is about. And I want to challenge you with this this last quote from John Piper, he says, the critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the friends you ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted and no human conflict or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ were not there? It's about his presence. It's about enjoying the good and perfect gifts in the presence of the giver of good and perfect gifts. Understand this, you become what you long for. You're beholding him right now dimly, but then face to face. And when you see him, you're going to be like him because you're going to see him as he is. And your salvation will be complete 
when you see the one you love more than anyone else. This is what you were created for. This is what you long for. Lord, we thank you that you have awoken a longing within us for our eternal home. Help us, Lord, to always live in view of eternity. Help us to not be distracted with what perishes with the using. Lord, I pray for us as your church here that we would come to comprehend with all the saints the depth and breadth and width and height of your incomprehensible love. Lord, we are loved by you. Such knowledge is too wonderful to us, too marvelous. Help us to comprehend. Help us to understand. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.